Today just happens to be uh, the day that we commemorate the prophet Isaiah. If you would like to know more about Isaiah, we've got six more chapters in Isaiah on Sunday morning. Uh, Isaiah is a, is a wonderful book because, of course, all the prophets have the gift of clairvoyance, right? That they, they perceive the things that God reveals to them, and they're also able to interpret what these things mean. But Isaiah is unique because what you find in the book of Isaiah is that uh, he, he has the picture of who Jesus is and who Jesus is to be and what he's to accomplish in a way that's much, much clearer than many of the other prophets. So all of your favorite passages that you hear, you know, around Advent and Christmas time about the virgin will conceive, give birth to a son, uh, about uh, how he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace, which is a good name for a church, uh, all of these things. Oh, and then Isaiah 53, that, you know, the servant of the Lord is pierced for our transgressions, he's crushed for our sins, by his wounds we're healed. All of these things are from Isaiah. And uh, I think maybe after the Psalms, Isaiah is the most quoted book in the New Testament. And it's been beloved by Christians, of course, since then. And Luther says that Isaiah is the fifth evangelist, right? Because we have four, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But Isaiah is so clear in the things that he tells us about the coming of our Lord uh, that uh, you read Isaiah, you know the full story. There's no way that you can't see Isaiah, or I'm sorry, that you can't see Jesus in the book of Isaiah. So, happy Isaiah day. Uh, so we will open with the word of prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, through the prophet Isaiah, you continued the prophetic pattern of teaching your people the true faith and demonstrating through miracles your presence in creation to heal its brokenness. Grant that your church may see in your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the final end times prophet, whose teaching and miracles continue in your church through the healing medicine of the gospel and the sacraments, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All right, anything about the sermon that you want to talk about? Had the sending out of the 72... They go out and they, uh, they impress themselves, you know, with their demon exercising abilities. And they come back and Jesus says, well, rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Anything you thought about? You enjoy that picture on the bulletin cover? <laughs> Very interesting. Uh, I told Shannon, I said, sometimes I feel a little awkward about when I got to preach on the ministry you know, and what hearers owe their pastors, but I'm like, it's what the boss said, you know, I gotta, gotta preach what the Bible says, so uh, the three that you could summarize from what Jesus tells the 72, like I said, is heed, feed, and pay, the word of the Lord, all right, so anyway, it was hardly the main point of the sermon, but uh, any, any thoughts that you had, any reflections? Mm -mm. To wash the carpet now. Okay, well, if not, so we are taking a break today uh, from our journey through the Old Testament uh, because we're doing another exciting edition of Ask the Pastor. And you might say to yourself, do people really ask these questions? Uh, the, some of them were plants. I told you the one. Well, see, the thing is, like, when I hear people talk, I take that as a question. So this one, I actually, a few people in our church actually, either individually or different meetings and things have brought up this issue, uh, which uh, what I advertise it as is very broad, um, the relationship between patriotism and the church. I think what we're going to end up doing, as you'll see, is our focus is going to get a little more narrow and specific than that. Uh, and uh, I wouldn't really... I'd like to hear from you. You know that I always have plenty to say, okay? It's an occupational hazard, and I put together uh, a very chaotic outline for you. doesn't mean that we'll talk about everything in it, uh, but, uh, you know, the point is always that uh, as Christians, uh, we, we simply think a different way, and, you know, when you encounter different issues in life and things, especially, as you and I know, that are really hot button, um, Yes, we want to get to what is it that God's word says? What is the right answer? Uh, but also, how is it that we think with the mind of Christ? What that means sometimes, and I'll tell you, full disclosure, uh, I am not trying, I almost never try, but I'm not trying to rile you up. 
Okay. I might ruffle your feathers a little bit. Uh, but it, it's important to, to think through things and to think through, uh, through the lens of God's word, through the wisdom of, of what comes to us through the church as we wrestle with the scriptures and other kind of practical things. Okay. So that's the motivation. And uh, I mean, drawing the people to Bible class is always a secondary motivation, but uh, I can admit to that. So I will pass this out to you, our giant doorstop uh, packet today. Uh, and I do have another, this is for afterward. I'm going to set this one on that table. That's what you can use the pen for, which is not a test, I promise. I will tell you one other thing, uh, not to be all gloom and doom or anything like that, but uh, I watched a really interesting documentary this past week that uh, had been highly recommended to Caitlin and me by a friend of hers. Uh, it's called What is a Woman? And if you know the answer to that question, you're ahead of a lot of people. Uh, it's, uh, it's something that, now I don't really follow the Daily Wire, but it was produced by the Daily Wire, which is a political, um, whatever you call it, not news, political perspective thing. And uh, the, the host, Matt Walsh, has been a blogger for a long time, and uh, I had never seen him before. He's a surprisingly good-looking man, I have to say. But uh, he is the master of doing like these deadpan interviews. You know what I mean? Uh, he's not trying to make fun. These things really speak for themselves. But basically what he does is, and he's a Roman Catholic also, but uh, the whole transgender insanity uh, that's going on in our country, he is, he is trying to not exactly get to the bottom, but to get these people who are the proponents of these things to admit uh, to the things that they believe. Okay. So he's trying to answer the question, what is a woman? And uh, he goes to the smart people, right? So he goes to like the gender studies professors, uh, goes to the politicians, uh, the pediatricians and the psychologists, the people who do those surgeries, you know, on adults and sometimes children to, to change their sex, right? It's the most disturbing thing I've ever watched. And they get really mad, though, when he finally gets to the question, what is a woman? Because they're talking about gender is how you feel. You know, the gender is, is not necessarily what's assigned you at birth or anything like that. Uh, and so finally he gets to the question, so you, can you tell me what a woman is? And most of the time they say, why does the answer to that question matter to you? And you can say a number of things like, well, I, the sports thing is one of them. Uh, what children are taught about in schools is another. People's, you know, general health and safety is another. So I'm just wondering, uh, what is a woman? And the answer is usually a woman is a person who identifies as a woman. And so he goes, what is that? <laughs> what, is, what are they identifying as? They get very, very angry. Uh, and uh, he's talking to the, the gender studies professor. The guy is very defensive and very sassy. And uh, Matt Walsh says to him, I just want to know uh, the truth. And the guy, you can see him bristle. And he says, the truth is a term that is very rude and condescending and transphobic. And you have 30 seconds to tell me your truth before I end this interview. So there really are people like this, all right? Uh, that uh, your truth is your truth, right? Not my truth. Uh, so how that works with traffic laws and things, I've never really figured out. But uh, so he says, well, I don't, have a, I don't have a truth. I'm just trying to figure out what the truth is, by which I mean what corresponds to reality. But I've never seen it more clearly how completely diabolical all of this really is. The transgender thing is not what, it's not some quirky dude who wears heels and has a quirky social life. 
Okay, that's not what the transgender thing is. There's a lot of money. There's a lot of political power involved in this entire movement. And the thing that fascinated me was that uh, who makes money from talking people into changing their gender? The big pharmaceutical companies and the, the, the puberty blockers that they sell to these people. Uh, Lupron, millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. The other use of Lupron is chemical castration for pedophiles in prison. And that's simply a fact. So he asked this, he's like, so this, this chemically castrates you. All get very, very, very mad. <laughs> okay. It's like, well, that's what it does. Like, is the, are you saying that's not a use? You know, it's like ivermectin is horse tranquilizer and has other uses, apparently. And they just can't, like, they cannot, they shut down. Uh, now, I tell you all of this, uh, it is a disturbing thing to watch. Uh, I do actually recommend it to you, uh, just so that you, you have some idea of what it is that, uh, that maybe not you and me so much, but your children, your grandchildren will face. Uh, what I don't like about it is that there is really not, no solution that's really given. You know, Matt Walsh has this platform to say, so what can you do? Well, we can talk about building strong families. We can talk about living the Christian life uh, and, uh, and figuring out where we can, we can shield ourselves and our children from some of the discourse that happens. You can't protect people forever. So that, that would be my critique of it. But uh, you need a subscription to the Daily Wire to watch it. Because um, I, I doubt any other um, streaming network would, uh, would stream it. But you can cancel your subscription. So you should watch What is a Woman. So I, that's just my little commercial. Um, there's many things I can say about that, but that's about, yeah, Jim, go ahead. What troubles me is why socially has it become such an issue in this time of life that two percent of society dictates that ninety-eight percent has to listen to. Mm -hmm. That's what bothers me. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, there's a furry in this documentary, actually. He, he thinks he's a wolf. Yeah. Um, because I we, we see it from a personal perspective. Mm -hmm. Our daughter was a tomboy, right up in, in the junior high. I mean, she was a tomboy. If this societal change is, is here today, they would have been pushing her to transform. And she is one of the best mothers, most Christian women you can find today. And who, how many kids are we harming? That just, just makes me very angry. Yeah, it, it does make me. Teachers are pushing it on as well. Yeah. Which really makes me angry. Yeah. And that's, he, he goes into a little bit. I think there's a lot of underlying factors to some of these things. A lot of it, surprise, surprise, has to go back to the intellectual foundations of the sexual revolution, uh, where psychologists began to say first that children are just inherently uh, sexual from the beginning of their lives. Uh, that uh, that's one thing. Then this whole other thing with gender being a social construct develops in this time too. But then it finally picks up, you know, in our own day and age. The other thing, and I wish you would have said more again about so. How is it that you ensure a healthy life for your children? We could have talked more about that. Um, but also, the, it's, a lot of it has to do with the influence and the exposure of young children to the Internet. Where, as you know, if you've got a phone, you can access anything you want at any time. You give an 11-year-old TikTok or whatever, they can too. And, uh, and because they don't have any raising or nurturing in their life, you know, they get babysat by the iPad or the phone or whatever. Um, and uh, because that's where it's like, I mean, that's how ideas are shared now, you know, is through the internet. And uh, impressionable little children 
tomboy. Nothing wrong with me. But this is a great. So he interviews his pediatrician, who's also a psychologist. It makes very clear from the beginning that she also like has some expertise in abortion. Uh, talking, and he's like, so, so children, you know, they can figure out, or that, you know, their actual gender at a young age. And she's like, yeah. And he's like, and you're not concerned that maybe a child shouldn't, you know, doesn't have the like the rational capacity to make decisions about sexuality yet. It's like, no. And he says, so you think a child understands these things that you're pushing them to? Yeah, of course they do. And he goes, you ever known a four-year-old who believes in Santa Claus? <laughs> she gets offended. She's like, yeah. And he said, so you know that there are children who believe, literally, you know, that, that Santa Claus flies around the world and delivers presents to children? Yeah. So, do you think maybe a person with that mindset might have a tenuous connection with what reality actually is? She's like, I don't see the point that you're making. And he's like, well, Santa Claus is not real. And the lady goes, he is in the mind of the four-year-old. I mean, what do you say to that? Yes, Virginia, there really is a Santa Claus. Okay, but it's like, these people are insane. Um, so you pray for him. And uh, anyway, don't mean to disturb you. I know you want to talk about this, but I watched it. I think you should watch it. Uh, and uh, you'll be disturbed. <laughs> you'll be disturbed, but uh, you'll know what to pray about. So, what is a woman? His wife is the one who gives him the answer, by the way, at the end of it. Uh, but, uh, anyway, okay. Mm, now I feel like, you know, should watch Winnie the Pooh or something like that. So, all right, uh, let's talk about some uh, very preliminary definitions. Not that you don't know what these words mean, but uh, just so we're, we're clear in the things that we're talking about. Since we're talking about patriotism, we have to talk about what patriotism is. Uh, good morning. Uh, patriotism, and this is all from the highest authority, okay? It's Google's English Dictionary. So anytime, if you want to define a word you put in Google, this is what it will give you. Uh, but patriotism, so the way that it's defined. The quality of being patriotic. So uh, somebody needs a slap on the wrist at Google because you're not supposed to repeat the word in the definition. But okay. The quality of being patriotic, devotion to and rigorous or vigorous support for one's country, okay? Uh, I have no issue with patriotism. I think patriotism is a good thing. I think you should love the place where you come from. I don't just mean the country, but I mean the state, the community. I never quite trust people who don't love where they come from. That's just a prejudice of mine. I encountered a lot of those people growing up, as you could imagine, because uh, people moved from a particular area of the country and came down south. And they tell you to their, your face how much they love the South, love it. Um, and then they criticize your tea is too sweet. And then they're like, your food is bad. None of you know how to drive. Like, we're all bad drivers, but Southerners are the ones that get in the accidents. And it's like, well, gee, it sounds like you want North Carolina to be Connecticut. <laughs> I don't think you really love it that much. But you know, oh, we're from such a terrible place. And then it's like, eh. I should. No, it is. Yes. You have to go to the like Chick Fil A in Lansing to get uh, to get real tea. But anyway, uh, yeah, all that to say, that's just one of my prejudices. I do not trust people who, who are not proud of where they come from. The great thing about patriotism is, if you are a true patriot, uh, that means that you want the good of your country and your homeland. Which I think is a Christian virtue. Uh, those are things that we should want. This next word is a word that today is bandied about a lot, and it's bandied about as a bad word, okay? And you read the definition and you decide for yourself. Uh, so patriotism is essentially pride in one's country. Nationalism is the identification with one's own nation. So then we'd have to define nation. Uh, it, when you talk about the United States of America, we think of America as a nation state that the nation happens to be the geographical borders of essentially the North American continent uh, and, you know, Alaska and all that stuff. But uh, nation literally is, is a people group. So that's important to remember. So it's identification with one's own nation and support for its interests. Okay, well, that sounds like patriotism. 
especially to the exclusion or detriment of the interests of other nations. So that's the thing that, that puts nationalism as an ideology in a kind of negative light. So if today, the way that our uncivil civil discourse goes, if you want to discredit somebody, you say you're a nationalist, right? The idea is that uh, it might not be always that the ideals of your country are lighting up with pursuing what you think your country's interests are. Okay, so you can think of the big bad guys as examples. Okay, uh, Hitler, nationalist, you know, he wanted what he believed was best for Germany. Is that in fact, does it live up to the ideals of what the German people believe? Was he a good and loving person? Well, you know the answer to that. So that's like bad nationalism. The thing that you'll observe though, is this word is kind of apparently like gender, uh, is fluid uh, because sometimes nationalism, bad, bad, bad. But then if you watch like the news coverage of what's going on in Ukraine, um, the Ukrainian movement is a nationalist movement because what they're saying is that they are identifying with their own nation and their own interests. They, they are not Russian. <laughs> They do not want to be part of the Russian nation or empire or whatever it is. Uh, and that would be a use of the word nationalism that really doesn't carry any kind of negative connotation. But uh, I don't hear the word patriot very much. I hear the word nationalist. So they, it seems that there's a distinction between those things. But it's just important to keep in mind that it has to do with your national identity. So in that sense, uh, preserving one's own national identity and interests I don't really see how that would be a bad thing. Uh, maybe the question is, what, what is the interest of your nation, right? Uh, the way Hitler answers that question, very different uh, from what's good and right. Stop me at any time if you have anything you want to say. Any questions? So two more. Uh, we will, some of this touches on the difference between the profane and the sacred. Now, profane... What, what the word actually means is not things that you said that get your mouth washed out with soap when you're growing up, okay? Uh, language I find so fascinating, um, and as well as kind of like the things that we're talking about, like flags and symbols. Uh, it's so fascinating the way that these things, in a sense, change, by which I don't mean woman changes its definition, but I mean like the way that the, like words are used. Uh, it's really the, the use of something that determines its meaning, if you're talking about in a linguistic sense. So what we've done, nobody's intended to do this, but what we've done with uh, the word profane, right? If I say that's profane, what does that mean? Like, if I say, well, that's profane language, Carol. <laughs> what kind of language are you using? Which you wouldn't do, but it's bad words, dirty words, right? Uh, so... The, the way that we've got to that is in the 19th century, you know, Victorian school marms taught children that you should not talk like profane people, okay, or vulgar people. We talked about the Vulgate last week. So, in other words, the way common people talk. There's not a value judgment. It's not a right or a wrong. Um, but uh, so, so profane then, what it's come to mean is bad stuff, things that are socially impolite, things that are, you know, bad words. Uh, what profane actually means, um, related or devoted to that which is not sacred or biblical, secular rather than religious. In other words, things that are worldly. Now, not anti-Christian, okay, but simply, uh, well, you all worked secular jobs. I work a religious job, right? Uh, my, my work has to do with the call that I have through the church. Uh, work outside of that is profane. It's secular, right? Nothing, not sinful, not wrong, but it's simply operating within a different sphere, okay? Uh, that's what the word profane actually means. Now, uh, you read the Bible sometimes, and when people step out of line, especially with Old Testament Israel, they profane something. Yes, they're committing a sin, but they're profaning something of God's because they're using it in an ordinary way, in a worldly way. So you remember we talked about when Uzzah touches the ark because he's trying to balance it out, he gets killed because God says, don't touch my stuff. Uh, it's because they, they are treating the ark in a profane way, not implying any disrespect, but they're not handling the ark the way that God said. He said, this is the rubric for how you handle the ark. And Uzzah, with the best of intentions, you know, touches it in a profane way. 
uh, your, your coffee pot is profane. You know, as loath as I am to admit it, uh, it's profane. And it's fine, you know, you, your coffee pot goes in your kitchen or at your feet at your bedside, you know, so you can get it as soon as you wake up in the morning, like Michael Scott's George Foreman drill. But uh, the, the place for the coffee pot is not on the altar, right? Because the altar is sacred. It is completely set apart for special use. So it'd be inappropriate to put the coffee pot or a flower pot or your car keys or something like that on the Lord's table. Nothing wrong with car keys, but all of these things have a particular place in the use. So if you look at the definition then of sacred, that which is sacred is connected with God. You can strike out the gods. Google is just trying to be inclusive. Uh, or dedicated to a religious purpose and so deserving veneration. So that is the distinction between the sacred and the profane or the secular, right? And secular not meaning anti-Christian, but meaning part of the civil, part of the worldly and the ordinary. Uh, but things in church are actually sacred. Uh, the building is actually sacred. The building is actually the house of God because the, this building has one purpose, which is unique and holy. And that is that it is set apart for the worship of God, right? Uh, when Jacob, you remember many moons ago, we talked about Jacob. Uh, he has his dream. Uh, he sees the stairway in the heaven, the ladder. And when Jacob wakes up, he realizes that he's had a vision of God. That God has been with him in a special way. And Jacob says, this is the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And the Sunday school teacher didn't pop out and say, no, 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 Jimmy. Like, God is everywhere. Did not say that. <laughs> Uh, God, God comes to us in a special and saving way in, in places, in certain places. So, that things are actually sacred, right? Our communion vessels are actually sacred uh, because they've been uh, set apart by the word of God in prayer for this special purpose. And they're not to be used for anything else, right? Don't put my coffee in the chalice. Uh, I don't, uh, don't throw the, the host to the birds. That would be to profane these things. All right. Do you understand the distinction in those things? All right. Okay. Interrupt me at any time. I've divided this into uh, maybe four parts. The first is we have to look at doctrine. We actually have to look at the teaching of the scriptures. Um, and I want to look at civil government. And I will explain why that is. Maybe I'll just go ahead and do that right now. Uh, there is a difference between... Uh, the obedience that God commands us to the government and patriotism. And this is what is confusing sometimes for people when we have talks like this in the church. Uh, obedience to the government does not imply, doesn't necessitate what patriotism necessitates. It does not require, what does it say, vigorous devotion and support for one's country. Uh, it's fairly easy to see. See, the great thing about living in our country is uh, we live, we do, live a fairly good life, I have to say. I think, uh, again, everybody should be proud of where it comes from. There are many, many wonderful things about America. People simply do not have it that great in the rest of the world. So, uh, but, see, see, so it's a little easier when American Lutherans, I talk about, you should be obedient to the government because God gave it to you. Well, what's the problem with that? I mean, I don't really like the taxes. I uh, don't like some of these politicians. But nevertheless, uh, I get to live a peaceful life. I get to worship in church without being afraid. Uh, I'm really left more or less alone. Except for the, you know, 20 permits and licenses you need to sell, you know, lemonade at your lemonade stand. But that's really not that bad, right? I mean, it's not like off with his head, he's a Christian. Okay. But see, that's not the same thing as patriotism. Uh, what we owe our, our leaders and our authorities um, is obedience and honor, insofar as it doesn't contradict what God himself has said. That's not the same thing as having warm affection for your country. So, patriotism, I think, is a good thing. The question is, what is it that, what is it that a Christian is commanded and obligated to do in terms of his government? So that's what we're going to look at. Um, of these passages, I've given you a handful. Um, let's look at Romans 13. If you need a Bible, you can come up, grab a Bible. I have to find Romans. 
There are certain passages uh, that we call sedes doctrinae. That means seed of doctrine. So there are, I guess you'd say, classical passages about, if you're like, all right, I'm going to look and see what the scriptures have to say about this. If you want to know what the scriptures say about baptism, we would go to Matthew 28, when Jesus institutes the sacrament, and he says, go therefore make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. This is the, the sedes doctrinae for the Christian view of government, Romans 13. Uh, would somebody read for us? It's not too long. Uh, Romans 13, 1 through 7, please. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, he is praised, and he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is a servant of God and an avenger, who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes to the authorities who are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Okay, thank you, Tom. Uh, this isn't really a Bible study on Romans 13, so we can't go over it really with a fine-tooth comb. Uh, but to, to summarize what St. Paul says, uh, he says that we are to be subject to the governing authorities. Remember that St. Paul is writing as a citizen of the Roman Empire. So I don't think he had many warm fuzzies in his heart about his government, right? And Paul would have told you, he's like, well, I'm not from Rome. You know, I'm from Tarsus. That's really my home. And, uh, you know, I can identify with some of that. But uh, nevertheless, so this is a man who's writing in, I believe it's the 50s AD. And it's a, by about 64 that, that Paul will be beheaded by the Roman Emperor Nero. The Nero starts really the first widespread and kind of systemic persecution of Christians. And he's able to say, honor the governing authorities. Because, uh, it, he says, because it's a pretty good system, right? <laughs> he says, because God gave them to you. All right. And this is the thing I love about being a Christian. You get to upset everybody, right? <laughs> so, I say the same thing. The Bible says the same thing. Whether, whether your guy is president or my guy is president, honor the Governing authorities, because he's God's minister for your good. If you can say it about Nero, you can say it about Joe Biden or Donald Trump or Jefferson Davis or anybody else. So, uh, been a, existed, uh, ordained by God. So Paul is very clear. Those who resist the authorities resist what God has appointed. Now, he tells us, beginning in verse 3, uh, these are really, what, what are the functions of government? It's a good question because, you know, Paul lives under a radically different government than you and I do. The, the similarities are becoming uh, more and more. But, uh, you know, there, there is no constitution. There's no representative democracy or anything like that. Uh, Nero is worshipped as a god. You know, Nero is, he reigns over all things. Well, the, the commonality then, this is what God's instituted. Verse 3, rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you then have no fear for the one who is in authority? Then do what is good and you will receive his approval uh, because he's God's servant. If you do wrong, be afraid for he does not bear the sword in vain. So there are these really these two basic things. The government is to reward the good. And I would say by extension to protect the innocent and punish the evil. That is what a government's supposed to do. That's what God has given the government to do. What follows from that is there are certainly ways in which earthly governments can step outside of what they're ordained to do. 
And that leads you to another issue, which is, so when may I disobey? And we won't have time to get into that today, I'm afraid. Um, I don't think these things are as, uh, as absolute sometimes as people would like them to be. You know, the classic example is, because it's the classic example for everything. You ever have an argument with somebody, you just bring up Hitler, okay? <laughs> you will always win the argument if you bring up Hitler. Hitler's become like this mythical character, but uh, this is exactly what happens in, in the German church, right? Uh, when the Nazis come to power. They go to the pastors and they say, now you remember that the Bible says submit to the governing authorities because they're instituted by God. <laughs> right? As a Christian, you have, uh, well, you have the option either to be faithful or unfaithful. But uh, even in Germany, different Christians come to different conclusions. Uh, some of them are like, all right, then we bite the bullet and we face the consequences and we smile on the way to the chopping block, right? Others like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you probably know his name, um, who was a Lutheran pastor in Germany, is, uh, left us a lot of books, uh, most of which I think are pretty good. Um, Bonhoeffer really struggles with this question. Uh, I can't revolt against the authorities. And Adolf Hitler is the duly elected chancellor of Germany. So what do I do? Uh, Bob Hafer's way around it is he, he joins the Abwehr, which is a German military intelligence. And uh, what, what soothes his conscience is he says, well, the Abwehr is the government. So maybe the citizens can't revolt, but the government needs to correct itself. So uh, Bonhoeffer is involved with uh, one of the failed plots to assassinate Hitler, which you can watch uh, in the movie Valkyrie. You ever seen Valkyrie with Tom Cruise? Very excellent movie. Uh, Bonhoeffer is not in that movie, but Tom Cruise uh, plays a Nazi. I believe he's a colonel, and he's realized the truth. Um, and he's also a devout Roman Catholic. Um, von Stauffenberg, I think, is his name. But that movie is all about how they try to they try to blow up Hitler and his bunker. Uh, it does not work, and uh, it's an excellent, really an excellent movie. Uh, colonel von Stauffenberg uh, had a distant cousin whose name was Berthold von Schenk, who uh, was a Missouri Senate pastor in America. Uh, anyway, that's your factoid for today. But so, so that's how we have to be able to address these things. But you see that they're not as absolute as um, we would like them to be, right? So obey the government. So then the government is manifestly evil. Well, he is God's uh, minister for your good. He, he only punishes the evil. You see, that's a very simplistic way of reading what St. Paul has said. But nevertheless, so what is it, though, that a government's supposed to do? Reward the good, punish the evil. Okay. Now, what then do we owe uh, to the government? Verses 6 and 7. For because of this, you also pay taxes. Sorry. Okay. For the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Again, St. Paul is saying that about Nero, okay? That is his ruler. Are there things that Nero would require that St. Paul cannot do? Yeah. Uh, and that's always the, the guiding principle is uh, we obey the government insofar as they do not compel us to sin. At which point we acknowledge God is the higher authority. And one of my favorite stories is when Peter and John heal, uh, the, is it the lame man? The one in the temple. Yeah, because he gets up and he's walking and leaping and praising God, as the children used to sing. Because uh, he wants a handout and they say, silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ. Rise, take up your bed and walk. So the Sanhedrin gets word of this. Uh, they, they bring them in, they arraign them, so to speak, and they say, all right, guys, now, no more. No more preaching or healing in the name of Jesus. And they essentially say, well, you kind of have to determine for yourself uh, what you're going to do. But as for us, it's better to obey God rather than them. So that's where that conflict is then. Uh, it's not an issue of, I don't want to pay my taxes. It's not an issue of, like Sammy Hagar, you know, I, I can't drive 55. You know, it's got to be at least 75. 
Uh, but uh, it's not issues like that. It is when the government, um, and in this case, we're talking about religious authority, uh, when they compel you to sin, to not preach in the name of Jesus, to not confess his truth, then you're obligated to do the opposite. You're obligated to disobey. So then they take them and they beat the tar out of them. And it says that Peter and John go away rejoicing that they were worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. So, uh, that is, in a, in a big nutshell, that is the scripture's view of government. And therefore, it's the Lutheran Church's view of government. Uh, that uh, we have always had a very high view uh, of the government. Uh, and these things are not opposed to one another. If they're all institutions from God, and the main ones are the church, family, and the government. Uh, being a Christian does not mean that we get rid of any of these things, but actually they're all supposed to support one another. So, now again, uh, and then I'll shut up for a minute and let you ask anything you want to ask. Uh, the reason that I bring this up is because I am telling you what is virtuous and what is owed to the governing authorities. Paul can be obedient to the governing authorities and honor his rulers without being a patriot, without being a nationalist. Now, I'm not saying you should not be a patriot, I'm not saying you shouldn't be <laughs> careful what you say, I'm not saying you shouldn't be a nationalist in like the good sense of the term. Uh, you will see how this factors into what the rest of what we're going to talk about. Uh, so let me pause. Do you have any, any insights, comments, or questions? Okay, now don't tell any of my friends that I'm doing this, but we're going to skip the Lutheran confessions, okay? <laughs> Simply summarizes what we just talked about. Uh, the, well, the one thing I will say, if you turn over the page, I did give you a, uh, a quote from the Apology or the Defense of the Augsburg Confession. This is something important to think about as we go forward. Uh, in talking about what is uh, the scriptures teach about um, government, uh, Lutheran theologians have always made a very important distinction, and it's called the two kingdoms, or the two realms. And uh, essentially, if we look at this quote, uh, the second one on that back page, this entire topic about the distinction between the spiritual kingdom of Christ and a political kingdom has been explained in the literature of our writers. Christ's kingdom is spiritual. And that reference, John 18, is when Jesus says to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. This means that the knowledge of God, the fear of God and faith, eternal righteousness and eternal life begin in the heart. Meanwhile, Christ's kingdom, so which is to say the way that God rules and reigns in the church, he rules by the gospel, uh, he rules by the word. Uh, Christ's kingdom allows us outwardly to use legitimate political ordinances of every nation in which we live, just as it allows all these other things. So he goes on, the gospel doesn't offer new laws about the public state, but commands that we obey present laws, whether they have been framed by heathens or by others. Okay, so Luther would say, if, you're, if your government is heathen, you obey the law, as long as it doesn't lead you to sin. Heathen people can govern just as well as Christian people. Uh, they say that Luther once said that he would rather be ruled by a smart church than a dumb Christian. Uh, that's a very provocative thing to say, but uh, I suppose I know what he means. The, the, the principle behind what he's saying is um, God gives us the government for our good. It is not necessary that the government itself uh, be ruled by the church uh, or anything like that, um, but that God uses all of these things for our good. Uh, the, again, the, the government is a profane institution. It's a civil, worldly institution. And so just like uh, two non-Christians can get married, legitimate and valid marriage, uh, we can have rulers, you know, who uh, don't make the Christian confession. I prefer it when they do, um, but uh, in principle, uh, this is true. So basically, that distinction then between the kingdoms, uh, the, what usually we say the right-hand kingdom, this is the church. The way that God governs the church is through the word. The way that God governs the left-hand kingdom is with the sword, right? And the sword, excuse me, is either used to protect and to reward, or it's used to punish the evil. Uh, so, that, that's the distinction that we uphold. Again, God rules both of them. He rules both realms. 
but he rules them then in different ways. Okay. You have any questions so far? Any comments? Do you need more coffee? Okay. That's the doctrine. Let's talk a little bit about practical matters. Uh, and again, this is just laying some, all these things are building on each other. Uh, so we have the kingdom of the world, we've got the state, and we've got the church. The God rules both of these things. Just want to begin with an observation. Uh, and this is from um, an article in which the author has a very definite opinion on one of these perennial issues, which is if you have an American flag, where should it go? You know, if it's on church property. But um, I think we can all agree on this that he says here. He says everything in the church is about Jesus. Everything in the church points us to Jesus. Art is a powerful communicator of Christ and the gospel. And he gives some examples. From the candles, representing the light of Christ, the light of the world. So, no, it's not because I can't see up there. Uh, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Um, because the light of the world is present on our altar, right? In his body and blood. So, the candles to the linen shrouded altar, representing the empty tomb. You really pick that up on Monday, Thursday, with the stripping of the altar. That the altar is stripped the same way that Jesus is stripped when he's beaten, right? And then you get to see that the altar is a slab, right? Slab for a body. That's what happens, you know, at the end of Good Friday, he's laid to rest in the tomb. To the baptismal font, uh, many of which are often eight-sided, pointing us to the eight people saved through water in the ark, Noah and his family. To the stained glass windows depicting events in the life of our Lord and of the church, to statues and paintings, even to the plants and flowers. Okay, so plants and flowers are not just pretty things in church, okay? Not just because we needed to put something on the back wall. And he says, reminding us of Eden, of the garden, and of the Lord and giver of life. Everything in the church points us to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and ultimately to the restored communion with the triune God, won for us by the atoning sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right. Uh, that's the purpose of everything in church. Now, there's a few things that are strictly functional. The seats are functional. Microphone is functional. So no, they don't have any symbolic significance. But it's really a fascinating thing. If you ever, you know, in your spare time, read about Christian architecture or anything, all of these things are completely intentional. And uh, you could look at it for 80 years and not realize it. Um, but uh, everything is symbolic in the church. It has a layer of significant meaning. We talked about a lot of those things, well, it's been over a year ago now, but uh, we, we talked about the liturgy itself um, and how even our services are ordered in this way. These things are not haphazard. We don't just do them because Grandma did them. Uh, but that's also true of our architecture. So what is uh, Pastor Bean? I've met before. Nice guy. Uh, what would be his question if we take um, an American flag in church? Uh, based on what he said here, what is Pastor Bean's question? Everything in the church points us to Jesus. What would he ask you about the American flag? Okay, but how does it point to Jesus? So I've already laid out for you that I'm an American, Southerner by the grace of God, but uh, I'm an American, love this country. Um, so I, I would think I'm a patriot. Now, I'm not paying the ultimate price, you know, for my homeland, and I hope I never have to. Uh, but this is the question. With flags, flags as symbols uh, mean so much. When you look at a flag, though, the thing I always want you to think about is what we usually do, and when Christians of goodwill and good faith have these conversations, when you start to feel the temperature in the room rising, they have jumped to question number two. So let me tell you what I think, and you can judge for yourself. This is what I think the two questions are, when you consider anything. 
the American flag, the cross of Jesus, whatever. The first question is, what is it? Okay. What? We've got one right there. Okay. What is it? Up there on the bulletin board. Okay. But that one, what is that? What is a woman? Yeah, Jim, go ahead. The American flag is a, is a symbol of the blood that was shed by our ancestors and those that are currently serving to, to guarantee us the right and the privilege to be able to worship God without fear of loss of life. Okay, yeah, so let's, let me introduce the second question and we'll see how this relates to what Jim said. There's a difference between the question, what is it? And what does it signify? So, in a real sense, if, if we speak of it objectively, and I don't disagree, uh, what is that symbol? It is the flag of the United States of America. Right? The meaning that we attach to these things. And again, flags are deeply meaningful. Uh, that is a different question. And I think that sometimes, I think at times what we do is we bring the answer to question number two to number one. And then if, if Christians have a disagreement about it, this is why people get upset because they're good patriots, right? And they say, well, if the flag doesn't belong there, then are you a patriot, right? So... Does it point directly to Jesus? No. Does it represent a government that we have been admonished to respect and honor? Yes. Yeah, that is for sure. God. For sure true. Yeah. And that's that's a good way to, to summarize it. So, okay, let's look. Hmm. Let's keep going a little bit. I think I'm going to skip the first one. We can talk about that at one point. Yeah, so let's look at some historical things. You know that I like history. That's how people get into trouble sometimes, but uh, I like history. I think history should be studied. Uh, I'm just presenting to you uh, the facts. Yeah. Um, one of the questions that you always have to think about uh, is it, whether it's in your church, whether it's in your family or anything like that, is why do we do the things that we do? Uh, and that's a question of significance, right? And the first question is always, what is it? Uh, the other question then is what, is, what is the actual history? However you interpret it, however you come to the conclusions that you do, okay? Uh, so I was told in seminary, if you do something in church for six months, if you change it, then people will say, Pastor, we've been doing that forever. And then you find out, and it's not that people are being dishonest. It's simply that people, relatively speaking, actually have a short memory, you know. Uh, so this is one of those issues. So, so look at what I mean. The, the long and short of it, and I can provide any of these resources if you want to look at them. Uh, the long and short of it is... Uh, that uh, in our country, in our context, uh, the, the U.S. flag appears in the church at a particular historical moment. So, just for your information, I want to tell you what that is. Uh, this is from an article uh, by Thomas Kidd, uh, who teaches at Baylor University in Texas. Uh, he's a Baptist. We won't hold that against him, but he's a good historian, okay? And he specializes in American Christianity. So, um, I have no footnotes for you. I can only give you what he summarized. Uh, but he says, scholars agree that flags became more common in American churches during World War I. He says in a very general way, German immigrant churches. Now, who would those be? <laughs> I don't think he's talking about German Methodists. German immigrant churches as in Lutheran. Okay. German immigrant churches and pastors suffered humiliating incidents relating to the flag, with pastors being forced to genuflect, in other words, to bow down, before the flag and kiss it 
by anti-German nativist crowds. So it's called the First World War for a reason. It's truly an international war and it's devastating. Uh, what human nature does a lot of times is we pit us against them. And so the, the basic uh, contention of people who are nativists is that you're either a loyal American or not. Okay, I can buy that. Uh, the way that you will prove your loyalty is in a very specific way. So remember the distinction that we've made, that the, that the Bible makes, between what it is that we are commanded to do and we should do in good conscience, which is to honor and obey our governing authorities. That's not enough for nativists. So they find people who are ethnically German, who, you know, eat schnitzel and do other fake German things that are not real, like Nancy Pope. And, uh, and they say, you are not a loyal American unless you prove it the way that I want you to prove it. Okay, well, what does the Bible require? Pay your taxes, obey the authorities. Pray for them, too, also. Uh, now, so, so you see... Yeah, unless it causes you to sin. Bowing down to a flag. Yeah. Is, is a, is an idol. Yes. An yes, indeed. Guess what? That's a sin. Yes. And and you're right. Uh, but but the other thing that's a sin is requiring somebody to do something more than the scriptures have said. So you can be patriot, loyal American, um, and loyal uh, to your governing authorities without being made to say or to do anything apart from that, right? So the example he gives is very extreme. Uh, worshiping the flag. I think we all agree you should not do that. Uh, but they're not under any obligation. To, it's like, you have to say America is the greatest country in the world. Does the Bible say that? Does the, I mean, does the Bible require me to be a faithful citizen to make that statement or to hold that sentiment? The answer is no. Okay. Now, this is where this begins. Uh, now, these other things, and again, I'm not, as you know, I'm not putting either the American flag or patriotism or anything in a bad light. But you see how some of the greatest things we have gets twisted into something else. Or this is what the devil does. Um, if there are people, not cases, of course, but if there are people trying to force German Lutheran to kiss an American flag or bow down to it. Uh, that tells you something about priorities, I would think. And this is something that we do have to be aware of. Uh, what is ultimately most important in being a Christian? Uh, it is a very important where you're from. Our country is very important. Uh, but these things are not like this. I'm not even sure they're like that. Right? Because our identity is in Christ. And it's, it's the true, true of everything. I mean, this is the nature of idolatry. Is that we always properly order our loves. Right? You love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Um, it's when we love God as we should that we're able to keep all of these other loves in check. Right, and to love my spouse the way I'm supposed to love my spouse without subverting the first commandment. Right. So I'm just going to give you a few others of these. There's a, a very common misconception uh, that uh, the Ku Klux Klan um, flew, flies which flag? Which flag does the Ku Klux Klan fly? Yeah, the Nazi flag and the Southern flag. Um, the, so the Klan has existed in different iterations. Um, the one that you and I like kind of know about is not the current Klan. Today, the Klan is more of a paramilitary organization, and they typically don't wear the hoods and stuff. Okay, But when you see things like in movies or you read about in history, burning crosses, lynching black people, um, with the pointy hats and everything, that is the second clan, okay? Now, uh, the clan was a nationalist movement, okay? 
This is what it says. In the late 1910s, the Ku Klux Klan was revived because the first Klan had gone away. After Reconstruction, they didn't really see any point to it anymore. But, but the Klan takes on a new meaning, and it's revived as an anti-immigrant, anti-communist movement. So their terrorism wasn't just directed against African Americans, but this is when the Klan begins to hate Jews, Eastern Europeans, and then Roman Catholics as well. That's not how the first Klan was. Uh, Klansmen pointedly gave a number of local churches and pastors American flags, which they insisted, and I'm sure they were really polite about that, uh, which they insisted that they display in sanctuaries. A letter from a Klansman to a Methodist minister in Arkansas stated that the Klan stood for the two greatest gifts that heaven has bestowed, namely the Holy Bible and the American flag. And you can see photographs of this. Uh, when, when these things were considered, I suppose, more acceptable. This great uh, parade, I don't know what, I hope it was the 4th of July, but it might have been. Uh, they're parading down good old Pennsylvania Avenue. Got the Klansmen and everything. American flag about this big. Uh, I'm just giving you the history of things. I have no problem with the American flag. No problem with being a patriot. But, pastor, we've done it forever. No, you haven't. And uh, it's the six-month syndrome. Now, remember that second question. What does this signify? Will lead you to say there are other reasons other than what happened to German immigrants and what the Klan did with the flag in churches that have to do with where we display flags. I grant you that point. But I'm simply telling you the history. Uh, give you one, one more from this article. Think one more. Some pastors were like Pastor Sheridan and very contrary. Some pastors rejected overtures to display the flag, whether you're talking about the pressure from the Klan or from the anti-German sentiment in America. Uh, don't know my Dutch names. When Herman Hoxma, we go with that, minister of a Christian Reformed Church in Holland, Michigan, okay, so in our neck of the woods, refused to put the flag in the sanctuary during World War I. He was reviled as a pro-German traitor and a communist. One newspaper suggested that pastor should be deported or shot. Another Dutch Christian reform minister in Iowa was run out of town and had his church burned by vigilantes for declining to display the flag. Um, and one more about particularly our history as, as German Lutherans. Uh, from this same article that I mentioned, Pastor Beam's article on flags. And it's just a historical observation. The practice of displaying the U.S. flag in Lutheran churches is a recent phenomenon. And it began because during the World War I era, and again during the Second World War, mainstream Americans were harassing ethnic Germans. And the German Lutherans felt compelled to abandon their German language and heritage and to try very hard to show their American patriotism, partially out of fear of being terrorized as the U.S. was at war against Germany twice in the last century. So, I'm simply commending to you that what the historical record says, it's back to the what is it question, um, that is the reason that there are flags, American flags, in American churches. That is why. Does that reason matter anymore? Probably not, but that is why. It's because your ancestors, whether they're, because I'm not a German Lutheran, okay? I really get the German thing, to be honest with you, but that's okay, you know? I just am from a different nation, that's all. But, uh, so either spiritually or lineally, in your blood, your ancestors were persecuted, harassed, had their churches burned, um, and not by the government, mind you, not by the American government, but by their own fellow citizens. And what they did, unless you want to be run out of town on a rail and have your church burned down, what they did was they said, we comply. And it just stuck. So, pastor, we've always done it that way, is not true. Uh, and the way that it comes about is through a, a deeply hurtful and a terrible thing. Um, so, why do I bring that up? Uh, like I said, uh, people have actually asked me, 
um, and it's been a, a point of discussion now in a couple of meetings um, about why this way or that way. What I'm given to understand, and I'm not telling stories out of school, what I'm given to understand is that uh, Pastor Shade had kept the flags back here. That's correct? Okay. Um, and then sometime before I came, the flags were back in there. So, but I, I wanted to have this conversation with you because we all love each other. Uh, we're all Christians of goodwill. And there are, there are reasons that you could be on one side or the other of that question. Um, but I still want you to know why it is that we are in our country at the point where we are when it comes to the display of flag in churches. So part of the question, though, as, as Carol helped us to see, is the question is, and we had different answers to about significance. The what is it question. Does it, the thing itself, do what everything else in the church is supposed to do in pointing us to Jesus? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so I take everything wrong with. <laughs> but um, again, I have no problem. Are they not the same thing? I feel like you're taking away from what you're there to do. Like you're there to do your job. I don't know. So, I don't know. Don't, like you said, don't take it the wrong way. Well, we know, Shannon, you're a patriot because you, you have oh, USA. I'm sorry, you know. I did not wear those purposes. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That, but that, so this is always the question. It is like, what is, what is the intention of things? What purpose do they actually serve? That's a fair question. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, now you'll notice one thing too. In our hymnals, we have a little section for national song. And every year I make doubly sure that two of my personal favorites, I don't know what else is in there actually, but uh, I love singing God Bless Our Native Land. Which that's the one, yeah. Which is the tune to uh, "God God Save the Queen" or "My Country Tis of Thee." America's beautiful, right? Dun 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 dun. dun. Yeah, "My Country Tis of Thee." Uh, it's also a British tune. Yes, yes. Because you listen to uh, their their national anthem, "God Save the Queen." Yeah, we stole it from them. We did. We stole a lot of things from them. Uh, but uh, the the difference though between that song and singing "My Country Tis of Thee" is that. My country tis of these things, the praises of America, which I have no problem with. What that, what those hymns do that are in the national section is they thank and praise God for the gift of your native land, whatever your native land may be. It's written by a German, okay, so what state do you think he was writing about, you know? Um, and then the other one, the opening hymn we sang was the one by Francis Scott Key, and I put a little blurb in there for you. Um, Francis Scott Key, yeah, same one, wrote Star Spangled Banner. Um, and he wrote that hymn, Before You, Lord, We Bow. And you see what he wants, and this is what you should want as an American Christian. What I hope and pray is that when Christ comes again on the day of the resurrection, um, when he sends forth everybody out of their grave, that from our native land, there would be a very big band of faithful. Because uh, that's the qualification, you know, for going into heaven. Um, this is an acceptable way. But see, these things are not, they're not specifically patriotic in the American sense. Because again, where is this flowing? And it is flowing to the worship of God. Uh, as all of our worship does. So no, I don't think if you sing my country tis of thee outside of worship, you're worshiping America. But the question is, what is it that we sing within the church? I don't think that's ever been a big deal here. There, you know, there are churches, certainly, where, you know, 4th of July we can sing the national anthem where they say the Pledge of Allegiance. My question is, what is the purpose of gathering as a body of believers? Right. I don't think that St. Paul has taken whatever, I don't know, 
the pledged in Nero in his church. And I don't, I, that's not an unfavorable comparison between the United States and Nero. Because remember, the principle is the same. Who is the ruler that God gave you? Ours, by the way, is the Constitution. But uh, who, who is the governing authority? And uh, I did give you this rather shocking picture that I want you to look at. Just remember, I'm not making equivalencies. Uh, this is a picture of the Archbishop of Buenos Aires in 1934, Santiago Luis Copello. That little thing in his hand is uh, uh, what uh, in the Roman Catholic Church, uh, I think it's called the Aspergium. And that's what they used to sprinkle the holy water with. You ever been to a Roman Catholic funeral? You didn't know what was going to happen. You get dabbed in the eye, you know, by holy water. That happened to me one time. I went to this Orthodox church, and the uh, Orthodox priest put his hand in the, the water dispenser. Like that, got me right in the eye. And that dude grinned at me. He was like, this is what holy water is, white boy, you know. But uh, anyway, um, that's exactly what he said, too. Now, he's a very nice man. Um, Archbishop Copello is blessing the Nazi flag. Now, I'm going to ask you a question with all my love and all my heart. Um, tell me, based on what it is that we owe government, according to what the Bible says, which is pay your taxes, respect them, and honor them. If you think that is the same thing as a patriotic display of anything in a church, tell me what is the difference between displaying the American flag in a church versus a Nazi flag. Do you understand my question? There is no difference. There would be no difference. Yeah, there would be none. And this is actually something, again, very much to the credit of our government. There would be a difference to an American or an us? Yes, yes, a profound difference. Yeah, you're just making a difference. Yes. Um, so that, that means that these things are then equally acceptable or unacceptable. I want you to think about that. Okay. Now, the, nobody's ever made us put a flag anywhere for any reason. Um, and they didn't, the government, as I said, didn't make German Lutherans do that. It was their idiot redneck neighbors, you know, who did those things. Oh, everything is redneck. Um, although I'm a hillbilly. But uh, the Nazis commanded that the churches put their Nazi flags on the altar. Um, but if the answer to the question is the way that you honor is to, in a specific and concrete way, show your patriotism in a church, then you cannot have any issue with the Nazi flag in churches. I just want you to think about if that's true. Um, you see what we avoid, though, if you don't do it? You, I mean, you avoid the whole issue. I love to avoid issues, you know? Um, again, there's not an equivalency between the United States of America, Nazi Germany. But we're talking about what is the actual principle of the thing. Okay. I understand what you're saying. But it's what that, it's just a hundred cloth. But it's what it represents. Is what it represents. Yeah, I agree. I, I have no, no argument with that. If we go that route, then we still have to ask the question, um, that which it represents, is this, is this congruous with what everything else is supposed to represent the church? That's the question. Right. So, um, yeah, so that's my point. Yes, ma'am, please go ahead. Just, just um, an observation. Yes. We didn't attend our church this week because we had friends. So we, we had our friends watch our church oh. in Florida, which is a Missouri Center Lutheran church. We can't regularly. And after this discussion here, we they actually started the service saying Pledge of Allegiance. Mm -hmm. It's just so confusing. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, that's well put. Uh, they, the they only do that on 4th of July. Yeah. Yeah, but that, mm -hmm. but it's just, it, uh, now after this, it's like, Wow, should they 
but my okay, question just an observation because yeah. they're both Missouri senators. Yeah, they're, they're both. <laughs> okay, that's yeah. something that's. Yeah, that's, this and this is the sort of thing that I want you to mull over and think about. Yes, John. I'm old enough to remember before we didn't have them under God. But yeah. I don't, you know, I don't ever remember doing budgeting in any church, but I remember during the school auditorium come up, teacher said, it changed to the you know, and we need to practice so we get used to Say it under God. <laughs> what a time to be alive. And in all fairness, yeah. the pastor down there, if the under God phrase wasn't in the budget, we just spent a week. Oh no, I'm sure I'm sure nobody's yeah. surely nobody says it that way now. But but I still believe that it may it may not be a direct tie to Jesus, but it is a symbol of why we're able to come to the altar without fear of death from, mm -hmm. our, from our government. And previous and historians, not so much going to Jesus, it changed. Okay. But historically. Yeah, I and I agree. And I agree. society continues. Yeah. John, you have some of the hand on the okay. The picture you got here, the yeah. artificial. Um, and down the it's the yeah. Now, I'm sure that the Nazis had done some not so good things, but they probably weren't as well known. So the picture is kind of like out of context because it's like he was probably hoping that in Germany would be good today. Yeah. But, you know, like the thing that it went Well, and yeah. So, so Hitler comes to power in 33, and, uh, but he was fair, I mean, he writes Mein Kampf before that, I mean, he's fairly clear about his fascist garbage, uh, and then I, I think it's pretty early on, the, the burning of the Reichstag, which um, kind of gets the ball rolling on his other <laughs> things that go on, but, but here's the question, though, is what business does a, a clergyman, pastor, priest, bishop, what business does he have blessing any flag under any circumstance? That's the question. Because it's based on our definition, right? That I didn't make up, right? Oxford languages gave it to me. Flags are profane things. Which, remember, does not mean bad. It does not mean sinful or anti-Christian. It means they are not set apart for a sacred use because God's word doesn't do it. So this, we could avoid this awkward situation. Maybe the guy was a good guy. I don't know. And then he's an Argentinian. There's a lot of Nazi sympathies in um, Argentina at that time. Uh, we could have avoided that. We don't go around blessing secular things. Do you have a rebuttal or response? Well, no, I'm just, I was going to go for, you know, recently there was a thing about, I don't know what church was. They're talking about blessing the bike for motorcycles. <laughs> <laughs> the animals. A lot of people bless animals yeah. too, yeah. And I've heard that there are some people coming up who bless their puppies. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which, by the way, who in here has had a house blessing? My daughter Linda had. Has. Okay. Good. Good. Yeah. Well, and that's what St. Paul says sanctify everything with the word of God in prayer. This is a fraught question, and then we'll get to Tom, but this is a fraught question because, as we all know, we associate many things and many meanings with flags and national symbols. I am afraid that, uh, again, well, let's, let's use the Pledge of Allegiance. So don't worry, we're not going to say it in church. So, But what does it mean to be one nation under God? The way that I would take it would be to say that we are, well, under God, <laughs> that we're under um, his mercy for everything that he's given us. Um, if we're unfaithful, we will be under his judgment. I'm pretty sure I know people who take under God, and I'm not saying it's what the pledge means, but I know people who take it to mean we're God's buddies, everything we do is right. I... I I do. I know these people. Um, and uh, 
this could be appropriated and said by anybody of any ideology. So this is the other thing about symbols, is that words and symbols have meanings that echo beyond the what is it question, right? Um, that's what makes this a fraught thing. Uh, and I'll happily bless your house. I will tell you this, Luther didn't think much of blessing material objects, apart from bread and wine with God's word and the Lord's Supper. Um, but uh, that we set it apart for a sacred use. And that would be the other thing. Um, can't What you do in your house, the sacred things you do in your house is you take care of your family, which is a divine vocation. You pray, you teach your children God's word, um, you live and you die together. Those are all done in faith. Those are sacred things. You have to ask what, what possibly sacred use can a flag have? Um, that's my question. You have, you had something that I keep interrupting you, John. So go ahead. Okay. Okay. Um, we're almost at the end of time, um, in multiple senses of the word. Okay. But, uh, how about, um, we'll stop and, uh, next week I am here next week, right? Oh yeah. Okay. So yeah, this is it. So VBS next week and, uh, in all likelihood we'll be in the sanctuary. Okay. Uh, because they'll have their VBS stuff set up out here. So we'll just sit, we'll sit in the pews, chairs. Uh, so regular time um, next week. And we can, we can talk more. We'll finish our discussion. Uh, I do appreciate, I don't mean to be dramatic. I do appreciate everybody being civil and nice and level-headed. Uh, one more thought out there. You may, please do, Dave. We were talking about the under God statement. Uh -huh. And I've had this conversation with Pastor Shady many times. Uh, one of the pastors before he came uh, was just absolutely anti joining the moose or the elks or anything where you have to swear an allegiance to God. Uh -huh. uh, and I can understand where he's coming from on that. He did not want anybody. He didn't say you couldn't go, but if he saw your picture in the paper as being elected president of the moose, yeah. uh, that was a bad thing right. because you had to swear to God. He, and I said, why does that bother you? Uh, well, what God are you swearing allegiance to? Or, or it's like, okay, a back of a dollar bill in God we trust. I swore an mm -hmm. oath before God to defend this country. Mm -hmm. We say it when we, we say the national anthem. And, and to me, it, it, it's kind of a, and I, I tried to argue with him, but he's a lot better doing that than I am. Uh, Sly, people. I only know one God. And when I swear an allegiance to God, I only swear to the God that I know who mm -hmm. I am. Right. And that's the way I that's the way I always perceive. I never even considered that somebody else might be thinking about another God when they're saying. Right. Yeah. So that that's kind of where that sort of is a gray area. I know mm -hmm. he was pretty adamant about not joining the moose or any of that, where you had to pledge allegiance to a God that right. didn't define the God you were. No, one of the pastors that was against it, he said, don't join anything that's a, an animal or a bird. <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> see, see, Dave is a very naughty person because he's trying to lure me into something else. But he's not. Um, yeah, well, that is the position of the Missouri Senate. But next question, uh, what kind are they talking about? Yeah, the the if, if you, yes, that is a very good question. Yeah. And that is that is what I think people need to think about. Because if, if they just hear God, it's like, I mean, you look at the God's on my side. you got a pyramid, you got an all-seeing eye. What kind are they talking about? It's like some Illuminati to me. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, think think about these things and let the tension sit with you, okay? Uh yeah. So I really listened to the tone, and I couldn't find anything that doesn't bother me. Uh -huh. It's just a simple way. Mm -hmm. if, if, if at some point in time the spirit moves you to say, maybe we should talk about lodges sometime, uh, go ahead and submit that question because I, I will tee off um, the majority of our older members. Uh, and I'll tell you that the Missouri Synod has always condemned lodgery for more for more than swearing to God uh, for religious syncretism, which we talked about last week.
But right now, we're not going to do that. Right now, I'm just going to be popular with patriotism instead of the logic. But uh, how about we close with the word of prayer? Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we are bound to thank and praise you for all of your good gifts to us. We do thank you for our native land. We pray that you would ever bless it and keep it by your mercy. We ask uh, that you would indeed, uh, by faith, by the formation of your word, that you would make us to be good and faithful citizens. Uh, that we would, uh, for the sake of peace, for the sake of conscience, um, and also for the sake of the gospel, uh, to obey the governing authorities that you have entrusted to us. We pray that you would cultivate in us a healthy love of our nation uh, and our land. We pray uh, always for the peace of our land, uh, for the revival always of God's people, uh, that it would be true what the psalmist says, that blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. We thank you ultimately for your salvation that you give to us through Jesus, our Savior. We thank you uh, that in Christ uh, there is no difference between Jew and Greek and slave and free and male and female, but that we are all of one nation, the Holy Christian Church. We pray that you would ever keep us uh, as members of your own people, that we might sing your praises forever. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you so much.